Hi everybody, Dr. Alice here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the structures that are involved in the processes of hearing, as well as how you perceive sounds. When we talk about the process of hearing, what we're actually detecting is sound waves from the environment. So remember in the process of vision, we detected light waves. In hearing, we're detecting those sound waves. Now there are three parts of your ear that are each involved in the process of hearing. We start with the external ear. The external ear, first made of this outer structure called the pinna, and then transitioning into the external auditory canal, is the part of your ear that collects sound waves from the environment. Think of the external ear kind of like a funnel. Once those sound waves get into the portion of the ear called the middle ear, the job is to intensify or make those sounds louder. In the middle ear, we have three small bones called the ossicles. The first ossicle, the first bone, is the malleus. It's right next to the incus in the middle and the small stapes at the very end. These three bones vibrate with the sound waves that were collected in the external ear. The part of the ear where we actually perceive sounds or actually hear them is the internal ear. And the internal ear made up of all of these structures, in particular when we're talking about hearing, we're talking about the cochlea, the part here that looks a lot like a snail shell. Not only do we need to know which structures are found in which part of the ear, we also need to know what the dividing lines are between the external ear and the middle ear and the middle ear and the internal ear. So the first dividing line for us to be familiar with is the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane, which literally is a drum-like membrane, is what divides the external ear from the middle ear. When someone says they burst their eardrum, what they're talking about is this dividing line membrane right here, the tympanic membrane. To transition sounds from the middle ear into the internal ear, we have another membrane hidden in this picture, but right underneath the stapes. And that other little membrane is called the oval window. The oval window is where sound waves transition from the middle ear into the internal ear, where I'll actually be able to perceive them. The internal ear where we hear sounds is called the cochlea. So the cochlea is actually made out of three fluid-filled tubes. Only one of those tubes is where we actually have the cells that hear things. The other two tubes are there to transport sound waves. So the first tube that sound waves are going to go into when they come from the middle ear is called scala vestibuli. So scala vestibuli, let's put a note here, first tube where the sound waves go. Scala vestibuli, tube number one. Sound waves will bounce through scala vestibuli until they find the part of the cochlear duct where they can actually be detected. So different sound waves are heard at different locations in the cochlear duct. But when we reach the correct location, sound waves that were bouncing around in scala vestibuli will start to bounce around now in the cochlear duct where we can actually perceive them. Once we've detected those sound waves, we'll then send them down into scala tympani. And scala tympani, I like to talk about as where sounds go to die. Once I've heard a sound, I put it into scala tympani so that I can get rid of it. Where I get rid of sound waves is this place called the round window. The round window is a garbage disposal. Sound waves bounce out of here. We can't perceive them anymore. We won't hear any echo from them. So if we look at these three tubes from the side, as well as all the ear structures, we can get a good idea of how the process of hearing works. So let's start over here on the left part of this picture. Notice that sound waves are collected by the external ear and they bump into the tympanic membrane. When the tympanic membrane gets bumped into, it starts to vibrate. And its vibrations will lead to vibrations in the malleus, which is attached to the incus, which is attached to the stapes. These three are my middle ear structures, 
Remember, they're intensifying the sound waves. Once we get to the oval window, now we're transitioning into the internal ear. Now remember, the internal ear had three fluid-filled tubes in it. So imagine those three tubes that we saw stacked on top of each other in the previous picture. We just turned them around 90 degrees. Now we see the top tube, the middle tube, and the bottom tube. So let's trace our sound waves. The first tube that sound waves go into is called scala vestibuli. Scala vestibuli funnels those sound waves down and down and down until they reach the place on the cochlear duct, that middle tube, where they can be perceived. The sound waves will bounce around in that cochlear duct. They're going to get heard by a type of cell called hair cells. And once those hair cells have heard them, those sound waves are going to transition into scala tympani, my bottom tube. Remember that once sound waves get into scala tympani, they're going to end up going out this structure called the round window. Again, the round window is my garbage disposal. I put sound waves here and they dissipate into the environment. This picture is an excellent one, not only to remind you about the anatomy of the structures of the ear, but also to help you talk through the process or talk through the structures involved in hearing. So definitely take some time to come back to this picture to trace the sound waves through the different structures involved in hearing. I want to go back to the three tubes that we saw in the previous picture to talk to you a little bit more about what's inside of these fluid filled tubes because that will be important for the way that we hear sounds. So the top tube, scala vestibuli, and the bottom tube, scala tympani, both of these are filled with a type of fluid called perilymph fluid. Perilymph fluid is not a fluid that's involved in the process of hearing. So think of this just kind of like a filler fluid that I put into these two tubes neither of which actually hear sound waves. The fluid that I have in the cochlear duct, the tube that actually hears sound waves, is endolymph fluid. What I want you to write down next to endolymph fluid is that it has a lot of potassium. It has a lot of K+. Because in a moment, I'm going to show you a picture of the way that I activate these little hair cells the cells that hear sound waves, and it has to do with all of the potassium that's floating around out here in the cochlear duct. So endolymph fluid, the fluid in the cochlear duct, has a lot of potassium, and I use this fluid to help me perceive sounds. Perilymph fluid, that's just a filler. I don't do any hearing in scala vestibuli or scala tympani. If we zoom in close, in the very middle of the cochlear duct, we see a structure called the spiral organ. And the spiral organ is what we use to actually perceive sound waves. So the spiral organ is made out of these little cells we see here that are called hair cells. Hair cells get their name because sticking out from their top are little hairs. These little hairs bump into something called the tectorial membrane. When they bump into the tectorial membrane, that's going to cause them to bend and lead to detecting a signal. Now I want to point out a couple of membranes for you to make sure we know them for the lab exam. The first one is the one we mentioned already, the tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane is sitting on top of the hair cells. What I want you to write next to the tectorial membrane is that the tectorial membrane does not move. The tectorial membrane does not move. The hair cells will move. And the way that the hair cells move is because of this basilar membrane, the membrane that's found underneath them. So the basilar membrane is the part of the cochlear duct that when sound waves are bouncing around in here, this basilar membrane will start to bounce around as well. 
which causes the hair cells to move, but they bump into the tectorial membrane. I like to think about the process of hearing kind of like monkeys jumping on a bed. So here's my little monkeys, the, my hair cells. They're jumping on this bed that's the basilar membrane, and these monkeys bump into the ceiling, which is the tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane won't move, the basilar membrane will move, and that's gonna cause the hair cells to bump into the tectorial membrane. So let's look at the nitty gritty details of how hair cells can hear a sound. So we'll start here at rest. When your hair cells are at rest, you're listening for sounds in the environment, but you aren't specifically hearing anything. So when we're not specifically hearing a sound, our hair cell is touching the tectorial membrane, but it's not really pushing on it. When the hair cell touches the tectorial membrane, just a couple of its ion channels are opened up. Those ion channels, when they're open, bring in some potassium, which is going to allow us to depolarize the hair cell and leads to us spitting out a few neurotransmitters. So when we're at rest, our hair cells are sending little pings or little messages back to the brain saying, hey, I'm listening. I don't hear anything yet, but I'm listening. Remember when we talked about how your reticular activating system pings your brain to keep it awake? That's what's going on right here. Not hearing anything, but I'm listening. That's a hair cell at rest. When there are sound waves bouncing around inside the cochlear duct, the basilar membrane on the bottom starts to bounce, which pushes this hair cell into the tectorial membrane. When the hair cell gets pushed into that tectorial membrane, notice that many different ion channels open up. In rushes potassium, in rushes calcium, and with all of this depolarization happening, lots and lots of neurotransmitters are spit out. When a hair cell is hearing a sound, the way that it tells the brain that is by sending lots and lots of different action potentials sending lots of messages back to the brain. But when we've heard that sound and we've sent those sound waves into scala tympani, remember where the sound waves go to die? At that point, the basilar membrane actually flips the direction that it's bouncing. And now the way that it's bouncing actually causes the hair cells to push closed all of their ion channels. If I push closed all of the ion channels, no potassium can get inside, no calcium can get inside, which means that no neurotransmitters are being spit out. So the way your brain knows that you finished hearing a sound is we'll go through a period of time where the hair cells won't send any messages. There's no action potentials at all. Your brain will know that we've gotten back to normal when we start to send those little pings, those slow messages that say, I'm listening, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, until I send all of the messages because I just heard a sound. As you're summarizing how the process of hearing works, the things I wanna make sure you know is number one, how many neurotransmitters are being spit out when a hair cell is at rest, when it's actively hearing a sound, or when it's just finished hearing a sound. How many neurotransmitters am I spitting out? And how many of my channels are open? Here's something that we didn't directly talk about, but I wanna make sure to mention it. The channels that are involved in the process of hearing sounds are mechanically gated channels. Let's underline highlight star mechanically gated. When I talk about mechanically gated ion channels, these channels literally get pushed open. So we can predict where a hair cell is if we say that all of the mechanically gated ion channels are being pushed open, that hair cell is bumping the tectorial membrane. Or if none of the mechanically gated ion channels are open, they've been pushed closed, 
I know I just finished hearing a sound. If just a couple of those channels are open, I'm waiting, I'm gonna hear a sound soon. So make sure we know the relationship between my types of ion channels and the number of neurotransmitters I spit out. One final thing for us to know about the process of hearing is we need to remember that hearing involves cranial nerve number eight. Cranial nerve number eight is called the vestibulocochlear nerve. The vestibulocochlear nerve actually communicates with both parts of the internal ear. When we're talking about the process of hearing, the cochlear part of that nerve is collecting the hearing information. That information goes back through cranial nerve number eight, through the thalamus, out to the temporal lobe where we have our primary auditory cortex. Remember, then we'll send it to the auditory association area to figure out exactly what it is that we're hearing. So make sure we remember the name and the number of the nerve that is used, as well as where in the brain we're processing this information.